You may be seated. Well, good morning and welcome back to Summer in the Psalms. And uh, hopefully you're enjoying it. This morning we'll be in Psalm number 90. Tim did a great introduction. Uh, this morning it might be something a little bit different uh, when we talk about lament. But I think it will benefit us as a church. And uh, so just hang on. In 1972, Judith Vorse wrote a children's book that went on to sell millions of copies. It's a mere 32 pages that may be familiar to some of you. She introduces us to the main character of her book, a young boy named Alexander. And starting on page one, we discover that Alexander is going to have a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. Alexander awakens from sleep to find he's got gum in his hair. He trips over his skateboard and he drops his sweater in the sink while the water is running. During breakfast, his cereal box is the only box at the table without a prize. So Alexander concluding it's going to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day, he states he will simply move to Australia, believing that folks in Australia don't have days as bad as his. Well, things soon go from bad to worse for Alexander. He doesn't get to sit by the window in the car. His friend Paul at school demotes him to being his third best friend for the day. His mother forgot the dessert in his lunch. And not only does he have to go to the dentist, but he's also got a cavity. It's a really terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day for Alexander. And moving to Australia is looking better and better by the moment. But that's not all. The elevator door closes on his foot. When he goes to buy shoes, the shoe store was out of the color of shoes that he wanted, so he had to buy plain white shoes. For dinner, he was served lima beans, and he hates lima beans. His bath was too hot. He got soap in his eyes. His marble went down the drain. He had to wear his railroad train pajamas to bed. His Mickey Mouse nightlight burned out. It truly was a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. The book concludes, though, with the quote from Alexander's mom. She says that some days are like that, even in Australia. This morning, I'm under no illusion that in a room at this size, that no one in this room is having a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day today. Some of you may relate to Alexander from the moment you woke up today. And I also know for a fact that some of you, you're having more than a bad day. For some of you, you've had a bad month or year or decades. For some of you, life has thrown catastrophic circumstances at you that have been going on for quite a while. One terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day would be a welcome respite from your constant reminder that life can be downright brutal. Not only do I know that life is hard for some of you, but it has progressed from being no good and very bad to words like overwhelming, crushing, devastating, hopeless, terminal, incurable. You wish it was just gum in your hair or lima beans for dinner or just a cavity at the dentist, but your problems are not so trivial. There's no escape from these unwelcome guests. And even if you were to move to Australia, the pain and suffering you're experiencing today would soon follow. So do you relate to Alexander? Has life given you more grief and despair than you know what to do with today? If so, I want you to know that God has a word for you. Actually, he has more than a word for us. Uh, he's given us a large portion of the Psalms to benefit from. And we can learn to turn that pain and grief into trust in the Lord. The Psalms give us a language to pray our pain to God, a language of lament that will help us grow stronger in our trust of the Lord and prepare us for suffering well. In the book of Psalms, it's a very theological book in that it reveals to us the character and the work of God, but it's also a very human book. The Psalms equip us to interpret our experiences rightly and by understanding our circumstances in relation to God and to others and to ourselves. The Psalms give shape to our expression and give us words to voice our hopes like we sang, and our fears, and our joys, and our sorrows, and to better express the disappointments and pain in our life. We can use the biblical language found in the Psalms to rightly communicate our feelings back to God in worship and in prayer. The Psalms prepare the people of God for suffering well 
in this fallen world. And by giving us the unfamiliar language of lament, words that are useful for navigating this life in times of adversity. Lament offers us timeless instruction on how to respond to hardships with faith and how to find the renewal of grace during the trials of this life. Mark Vergrop, uh, if you're not familiar with his book, Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy, uh, it's a great book on the subject of lament. He defines lament in this way. Lament is a prayer. It's a statement of faith. Anyone can cry, but it takes faith to turn to God and lament. Lament is the honest cry of a hurting heart wrestling with the paradox of pain and the promise of God's goodness. Lament is a prayer in pain that leads to trust. Christians affirm that the world is broken, God is powerful, and he will be faithful. Lamentations allow us to better, more biblically weep with those who weep. It's a language for loss. It's a solution for silence. It's a category for complaints. It's a framework for feelings, a way to worship, and a process for pain. The book of Lamentations and approximately one-third of the Psalms are given to lament. They show us how to grieve with hope, ultimately leading to trust. They remind us that pain and loss are frequent experiences of God's people, but in the midst of pain and loss, we can keep our eyes fixed on the hope that lies before us in Christ Jesus. As you might guess, lament can be awkward for individuals and for churches. As Kurt mentioned last week, this type of language can be uncomfortably honest and raw. We don't speak this language well. We often go through great lengths to avoid public mourning and grief rather than admitting our suffering or even worse, placing our grief on display for others to experience alongside us. We just want our hurt to disappear before anyone notices it. If we're not the ones suffering, then we often want the discomfort of others to remain private also because seeing life as it truly is just makes us uncomfortable. We don't know how to deal with public suffering very long. We just want someone to fix it. We just want it to go away. Hopefully, you know that you ought to pray to God in times of suffering. But you may not know how to pray or what to pray for when you suffer. You might pray for relief of physical suffering, but you're unsure of how to pray for when the questions and unrest that remain in your heart and in your soul and in your mind, when they don't go away, when the suffering still remains. You continue to carry a heavy burden that's unseen to the rest of us, and you may fear that God has abandoned you or that he no longer hears your prayers. Well, this morning, we're going to look at Psalm 90. We're going to use this psalm as an example of how a follower of Christ can lament to God in this broken and groaning world. So if you would, go ahead and start turning towards Psalm 90. This is a psalm of Moses, as Tim mentioned, and it is a corporate lament. Uh, It appears to be written near the end of Israel's 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Although we're unable to pinpoint exactly when the lament was written or what specific occasion that Moses was lamenting, let us consider the events at the end of Moses' life that likely influenced this prayer. After the exodus from Egypt, Moses and the people of Israel had been wandering through the wilderness for 40 years and seeking rest in the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses has seen his brother Aaron, his sister Miriam, and the remainder of the adult population, those who were previously unwilling to conquer the promised land, they all died in the wilderness because of their unbelief and their disobedience. And in Deuteronomy 3, we find Moses pleading with God for pity, saying, O Lord God, you have only begun to show your servant your greatness and your mighty hand. Please let me, excuse me, please let me go over or excuse me, he says, for what God is there in heaven and on earth who can do such works and mighty acts as yours? Please let me go over and see the good land beyond the Jordan and the good hill country in Lebanon. But the Lord was angry with me because of you and would not listen to me. And the Lord said to me, enough from you. Do not speak to me in this matter again. After the miracles of the Exodus and after 40 years of God actively leading and carrying Israel through the wilderness, Moses believes that God has only begun to show his greatness. There was so much left for God to reveal to his servant Moses, and Moses knows this. Moses also knows that he will suffer the consequences of his sin, and he laments. But as a mercy, God does grant Moses a portion 
of his request. Moses commands Moses, Moses, the Lord commands Moses to go up to Mount Nebo and up to the top of Pisgah. And there the Lord shows Moses all the promised land, a land that he would never enter because he previously did not believe God and uphold him as holy, but instead sin striking the rock at Meribah. He could see the promised land, but was forbidden to enter it. And it was on top of this mountain that Moses died. Moses was 120 years old when he died, and the Bible tells us that his eye was undimmed and his vigor was unabated. Moses didn't die because of illness or old age. He died as the result of sin. So in this psalm, Moses, the man of God, offers up a corporate prayer lamenting the brevity of life, the certainty of death, and the unknown or the unknowable fear of living a life of toil and trouble under the shadow of God's anger and wrath being poured out on mankind for sin. His lament can serve as an example to us, both personally and corporately. It can give us a model of how we can pray our pain and our frustrations to God. So let's grow together as a church this morning. Let's learn how to pray to God using the language of lament that might lead us to a greater life and trust in God. We're going to use the acronym this morning, TCAT, uh, this morning, because I found this pattern very useful and easy to remember. This is taken from Mark Vergroff's book, Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy. Uh, you may be familiar with the acts of prayer. What? Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. The acronym TCAT is turn, complain, ask, and trust. It'll help us remember the four movements of lament. So let's start with T. Turn to God as we read the first two verses of Psalm 90. Let me take a sip. A prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth and ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting you're a God. It may seem the obvious response to enduring hardships of life is turning to God in prayer. However, our flesh often has an impulse to turn elsewhere. Where do you tend to turn when hardships show up? When life gets tough, we like to turn to places like where? Silence. We turn inwardly. We turn to ourselves. Some may turn to entertainment or medication. Others to drugs and alcohol. Others may turn to excessive shopping, community service, focusing on acquiring money or power or excessive work. However, the believer has much better resources to deal with these painful seasons of life. We have a community, the church, that should be or should help bear one another's burdens. But even then, we stop short if we only seek comfort from others. Ultimately, any hardship should remind us that there is only one source of comfort, the God of all comfort. God is our only source of lasting comfort. And here is our comfort in affliction, says the English Puritan Stephen Charnock. As a sovereign, he is the author of afflictions. As a sovereign, he can be the remover of them. He can command the waters of affliction to go so far and no farther. If he speaks a word, a disease shall depart. As soon as a servant shall from your presence with a nod. If we are banished from one place, he can command a shelter for us in another. The exercise of his authority is not without an exercise of his goodness. He does not correct for his own pleasure or the creature's torment, but for the creature's instruction. Though the rod be in the hand of a sovereign, it is tinctured with the kindness of divine compassion. He can order them, the afflictions, as a sovereign to mortify our flesh, to try our faith. In the severest tempest, the Lord who raised the wind against us, which shattered the ship and tore its riggings, can change that contrary wind for a more happy one to drive us into the port. The triune God of the Bible is that port of safe haven. He is the refuge of all generations of faith. He is the dwelling place of those who come before us, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he is the dwelling place of the church today, and he is the refuge of those who will come after us in faith. His care and provision will never grow faint. He is our strong and safe refuge, and he is the dwelling place for all generations, and that's why we turn to him. We turn to God because he is the eternal dwelling place, who is from everlasting to everlasting. Without eternality, 
His perfection, such as omniscience and immutability and love and countless others, they lose their steadfast radiance. And since he is an everlasting refuge, his love cannot be extinguished. His justice cannot fail. And his nature is not susceptible to change. We often dwell on God's power and goodness. However, it is his eternal nature because he is uncreated, undependent and unchanging, that he can be the eternal refuge from all that troubles us in this world. And he is the only refuge from God's anger and wrath against sin. Charnock continues in his description of God, our eternal dwelling place, when he says this, You have kept an open house for us, sheltered us against storms, and preserved us from mischief, as a house does an inhabitant from wind and weather, and that not in one or two, but in all generations. And our refuge and defense has not been from created things, not from the ark, but from the God of the ark. The everlasting God must be, must not only be our dwelling place against the toils and troubles of this world, but also against the righteous judgment of God upon sin. There is no other dwelling place that can shelter you from God's anger and wrath other than God himself. Which brings us to Moses' complaints in the next few verses. Moses will turn to God, expressing two complaints. But first, let me take a rabbit here, chase a rabbit. Uh, I want you to understand that when you read the Psalms of Lament, like I said, that's a third of them, you often find complaints about God withdrawing his presence or seeming to hide his presence from his people. Many of the Psalms express these complaints with words like, Why? Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of my enemy? Or as Jesus cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or you'll see the word how, how long, O Lord, will you look upon? Rescue me from their destruction, my precious life from the lions. How long, O Lord, will you hide yourself forever? How long will your wrath burn like fire? Just be aware that some of these complaints often come in the form of questions about God. So let's read verses 3 through 11 and see how Moses expresses his frustrations using the language of lament. So here's the C. Complain to God. You return man to dust and say, return, O children of man, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are like 70, or by reason of strength, 80, yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? We see Moses' complaint revolve around two simple and universal truths. Life is short, and life is hard. The man of God can have complaints before God. It's okay to complain to God in your prayers. And by complaints, I'm talking about expressing various questions and frustrations that you might have about God or how he is fulfilling his perfect will. Moses expresses his frustrations with the shortness of man's life using the language of time. Days and years are words that are repeated throughout these verses in 3 through 11. We quickly recognize that man's life is finite and fleeting and that life is short. The brevity of man's life is both the consequence of sin and the evidence of God's active presence in our lives. Our fleeting existence reminds us, or it should remind us, that all who are in Adam were taken from the dust, and to dust we shall return. Moses laments this fact. We too often lament this fact under our breath, usually, when we complain about the passing of time. It passes so quickly. We wish we had more time. We feel lost and regret because we thought we would have more time than what God has given us or ordained for us. But 
Because we are born in the line of Adam, life is swept away as with a flood. It's diminishing like a dream. It quickly fades and withers like the grass. King David also laments, too, in Psalm 144. He says, O Lord, what is man that you regard him or the son of man that you think of him? Man is like a breath. His days are like a passing shadow. God outlasts all creation for he is eternal and time is a relative to him. When compared with God's eternality, our life and existence is almost insignificant. We don't like to admit this reality and neither did Moses. So he complains and he laments this fact before God and you should too if you find the shortness of life frustrates you. Moses also complains that life is hard. If the brevity of man's life is not enough and we're doubly cursed by being placed under God's anger and wrath for sin, making life hard, filled with toil and trouble. As we lament how hard life has become, we should remember that God's anger and wrath is the just consequence of our sin. And although a greater part of God's judgment is reserved for the day of his choosing, we still remain in this groaning world that is saturated with the effects of sin. The cause and effect of sin is a short and hard life. If God sees fit to give you 70 years of life, it'll soon be swept away. If you're given 80 years of life, even it is cursed with trouble. Suffering and grief will exist until our Lord comes again and makes all things new. There would be no tears or no grief in this world were it not for sin. And yet sin remains. And yet you can cry out. You should cry out to God and lament the effects of sin that torment your life. I know we all have these questions and frustrations. Would you like to cry out to God today? What about? You've been suffering physically? Cry out to God. You've been suffering in your marriage? Have you been weeping over a wayward or lost child who's rebelled and gone away? Lament to God. Does your family ache over infertility? Lament to God. Whatever and whenever there are tears... There's an opportunity for you to lament because life is hard. In verses 7 to 10, Moses turns his complaint from you and they to we and our. He laments his sins as well as the corporate sins of the people of Israel. He brings up all the sins of the people and not only the obvious transgressions, but even the secret sins. God has perfect knowledge of our sins. There is no sin that is secret to him. I think we all know this. The writer of Hebrews says, No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Thomas Watson warns us about our secret sins when he says, Let me warn you this day not to sin in secret. Know that you can never sin so privately, but there are always two witnesses, God and conscience. We know there's no escape from his all-seeing eye, nor can we escape the outpouring of his eternal anger and wrath unless we have clothed ourselves with the righteousness of Christ. So we should also lament our sins. And lastly, because sin results in a short and hard life, Moses cries out with the rhetorical question, who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? No one. No one can fully understand the power of God's wrath towards sin. And knowing that our death is the inescapable punishment upon sin, we should fear God. And we should fear Him much more than we do. Moses realizes this. And it is with the recognition that no one is able to escape God's anger or ever even fully understand God's wrath that Moses laments. Unless God acts, we are left to suffer a short life of toil and trouble. It is here that Moses ends his complaining. He will stop complaining to God and he will begin boldly asking of God. Our prayers too must make a turn after complaining to God. We don't start with our laments by complaining to God, but turning to God. And our laments don't end with complaining to God, but boldly asking of God. So after complaining to God, we must boldly ask of God. 
So what does Moses ask for first? Verse 12 tells us that Moses first asked for a heart of wisdom that comes from examining our short and difficult life. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. When you reflect on the brevity of life and you fully understand that suffering, trouble, and death are the consequences of sin, does it motivate you to ask for true wisdom? Here Moses clearly and boldly asked God to teach us and to give us a life of wisdom that would reflect the life and goodness of our Creator. We too must seek wisdom from above, a wisdom that is greater than all the wisdom found in creation. We too must seek a wisdom that is external to us, one that must be revealed to us. May God teach us to observe and reflect on the order of this world and to discern that our sin is the source of our short and hard life. To refuse to acknowledge this cause and effect is foolishness or folly. Lamentations can be the teacher that leads us to wisdom. Ecclesiastes tells us that the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. Out of pain and suffering, Moses sought a heart of wisdom and the blessings that wisdom promises. When we face trials of various kinds, we too can boldly ask for wisdom. James tells us if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. We can ignore the fact that God has limited our life, that sin makes living life hard, and continue to live under the wrath of God, or we can gain the wisdom of God by boldly asking. Let's boldly ask God for his wisdom. In verses 13 through 17, boldly, Moses boldly asked for several more things. Look at verses 13 to 17. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad in all of our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Moses pleads to God to return to his servants in his steadfast love and that a time of rejoicing and gladness would also return. He doesn't ask for a longer life. He doesn't ask for relief from these light and momentary afflictions. Instead, he pleads with God. He pleads that a lifetime of affliction and evil would be replaced by an equal portion of gladness. He requests that God's works be gloriously shown to his people and their works be established and blessed. In our lament, what can we boldly ask for? Number one, let's boldly ask that God transform you. He can take a weak and afflicted judge sinner and transform you into a joyful servant. Will you turn to God and ask him to make you and make your days joyful? He can take your sadness and turn it into joy through the work of Christ empowered by the Holy Spirit. So pray to God, ask him to act in accordance with his character and with his covenants. Boldly ask God to reveal his steadfast love. Ask boldly that he will bless all generations that dwell in him as their refuge. We can pray in confidence that God will not destroy his people, though they will indeed suffer and even perish. Suffering and death is normal in this fallen world, but be of good cheer. Christ has overcome this world and he has conquered the grave. Moses boldly asked God himself, that God himself would establish the work of his people's hands. And then he repeats his request like a hammer blow to drive the point home. Ask God to establish your works for his glory. Ask, or if God answers that plea of Moses, just like if he answers our plea, then our work will not be in vain. Always give yourself to the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain, says 1 Corinthians 15, 18. Your work will matter because God is going to renew all creation. He will raise the dead and he will reward the faithful. May we, 
We may not be able to explain how God will establish our work, but you should ask him to do it, and you should trust that he will do it. Moses boldly asked God to display his divine works. He wants to see deliverance from this short and hard life and to experience a divine blessing equal to all the years of suffering. He asked God to compensate his people with years of blessings in proportion to their years of their earthly suffering. You can ask for this same blessing. Ask that God would give you joy and gladness, if not in this life, then in the life to come. For as many days as you have afflicted us, it says, we currently live in these many days of affliction under sin, under its effects. And yet we can and we should ask for God's blessings upon our lives. This night of toil and trouble will come to an end. And we should boldly ask for our mourning to be filled with the satisfaction that radiates from God's everlasting and steadfast love. Boldly ask in anticipation of a future favor and blessing that will not be brief, fading, or temporary. The final movement of the prayer of the man of God was to trust in God. So here's your tea. Trust in God is our final step in lament also. Some of the Psalms end with a very pointed language that indicates trust in God. Psalm 13 says, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. Or Psalm 31 says, but I trust in you, O Lord. I say you are my God. Many of the other laments end with confident statements about who God is and what he will do. Psalm 90 ends without a specific statement of trust in the Lord, but it doesn't leave us hanging. We know that the next move is to trust God. So, how can we grow in our trust in God by continuing to lament? First, lament will lead you to trust while waiting. The Lord will answer your prayers in His timing. Lamentations 3 tells us the Lord is good to those who wait for Him, to the soul who seeks Him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Trust strengthened by waiting is good for us. Did you hear me in the back? Let me repeat it for you. Learning to wait on God's good timing is good for us. Church, know this. Trusting in God may not relieve or eliminate your immediate suffering. Remember that suffering is spiritual warfare and evil will not be completely eliminated in this age. Your life of faith will always be a struggle with trust. Allow your trust in God's timing and in his goodness to keep your circumstances in perspective. Lamentations 3 also says, For the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not afflict from his heart or grieve the children of men. Keep trusting Christ. He will not cast you off forever. Persevere in trusting in his goodness, knowing that his steadfast love, his covenantal love, will lead you to rejoicing and gladness. You can have confidence that the language of lament will not be spoken forever. Jesus is returning to make all things new, and your suffering has an expiration date. Trust that your hardships are finite, but his mercies are infinite. Do not grieve as a people without hope because of Christ, and your pain will not go beyond what he has purposed. So use the language of lament to help you persevere. Keep turning back to God. Keep complaining to God. Keep asking Him to sustain you in the pain. Know that lament does not always lead to an immediate solution or deliverance from your pain, but it should lead to a greater trust in God while you wait. Next, lament will lead you to trust during confusion. We now see through a mirror dimly. Your questions of when and how and why may never be answered to your satisfaction in this life. Yet, when we cannot fully see or fully understand, we continue to trust. You can expect to be confused about your circumstances, 
but do not be confused about God's character. Believe that you know what you know to be true about God, even when the facts of your suffering and pain might call the, cause those beliefs into question. Trust and continue to lament even when you don't understand. Also, lament will lead to transformation. We are not yet glorified and we are being sanctified daily. The work that God has begun in us has not yet reached completion. We should understand that it is these seasons of suffering and waiting that God will use to shape us, grow us, and transform us into the likeness of Christ. Romans 5 Verses 3 through 5 says, We rejoice in sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Know your desire for efficiency and quick progress may be met with months or years or decades of painful waiting that seem unproductive, wasted, or worthless. But these times of men are not a waste of time. God uses suffering and time to produce his saints. Trust God to complete his work in your life and in his power and in his timing. The Spirit blows where He wills. God's timing and methods won't always make sense to you. Although God will not answer all your questions about your suffering and pain, you can trust in His infinite goodness and His righteousness. Trust in the character and covenants of God. As Tim mentioned a couple weeks ago, suffering can make you forgetful of things you already know about God. So we need frequent reminders from God's Word. Trust Christ. Trust in his work and rely on his spirit. You can find hope in the midst of any trial if you belong to Christ because you have a gracious Savior who bears your sins and he carries your sorrows. He is the suffering Savior who in the days of his flesh offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who is able to save him from death and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Have you put your faith in Christ? Have you lamented your sin? Have you followed Christ in obedience? If so, then dwell on his character. Have confidence in the truth that Jesus is interceding for his people. Those who are in the midst of of suffering. This truth should console you while you're in your sufferings as well. So how long should we wait in our suffering? Well, we know we shall not wait forever, but we shall wait until Jesus returns and our faith is made sight. How long shall we wait? John tells us in Revelation 6.10 that the martyred saints the ones who are crying out below the altar, who are crying out for justice, they were asking as well when they cry out, how long? And they've been handed their heavenly robe and told to rest a little longer. How long shall we wait? A little longer. We've read the book and we know all the sad parts that many of you are living out today. But be of good cheer. We know how the book ends. There is a day coming when he will wipe away every tear from your eyes. And death will be no more. And neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. He will restore the years that the locusts have eaten. God has spoken, and he will do it. But until that day, you shall pray. You shall lament continuing to turn to God in whatever circumstances you're facing. You can complain to him about anything pressing in around you today, but do not stop there. You must boldly ask of God to work according to his character and his covenants that you know are true. And if you have questions about his covenants and characters, ask somebody, read the Bible, talk with one of your elders. You can talk and pray with one of your elders today. Stop by after the service in room 120 before you leave if you have questions or if you seek prayer. 
You can ask God to give you a heart of wisdom today, to satisfy you with gladness, to give you joy today as you face trials of various kinds. And then you can trust God to fulfill all his promises. If the Lord is your all-powerful and everlasting dwelling place, then learn to use these laments found in the Psalms to strengthen your prayer life and your trust in him.